Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's a great opportunity to to share this this talk with you, and to it's an honor for me to be the last one, you know, the the one that is closing the the seminar. As you say, have been, I think we, uh, you had a lot of success in this uh, organizing this seminar. Um, it's nice to, to 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 give this talk. So that's it. So I would like to tell our recent work with uh, Professor Ezequiel Barbosa, that right now is a postdoc in uh, or a visiting professor in the Universidad de Granada. Uh, but uh, he's a former prof professor uh, in Minas Gerais. And we are going to talk about uh, today about non compact free boundary minimal hypersurface in the Riemannian sparse field space. So I would like to start with a brief introduction about what means this sparse space and why we are going to study uh, free boundary minimal surface and then to establish our result. And my idea is to give the ideas of two of the main settings of ideas that we are going to, to use in the in the in the proof because I think that you can use in other other realms and not only in this one for the sparse field space. So that say let me okay so this is more or less the overview of the talk that we are going to see the introduction motivation then we are going to focus in the sparse field space we are going to look for some previous result and then our result and then we are going to prove a couple of uh, theorems that we're going to establish here. And as a bonus uh, section, we are going to talk uh, the, uh, about the last part of the paper is about the density at infinity. But here I'm not going to prove anything because I'm not going to have time, um, but only give the idea of, the, uh, of what we did. <clears throat> so, okay, let's start with the, with the beginning, right? So we are going to study asymptotically flat manifolds. Uh, in, in the sparse field space is one of these asymptotically flat manifolds, uh, and these are, are important in mathematical general relativity because they appear as model as isolated gravitational systems. Because they appear as initial data set. Initial data set can be seen in the ADM for formalis, a way of rewriting the space time as a evolution of space in time. They say the following. You have a space like hypersurface with an with a with a metric, with an interior metric, and then you can see it embedded in a space time with a some exterior curvature, some second fundamental form in this space time. And then these two quantities, the interior metric and this uh, extrinsic curvature, uh, give you the dynamical variables in the Hamiltonian formulation of the Einstein equation. And then you can see how it evolves this initial data set or this space in time. So that's why we we call this initial initial data set because it can be seen as initial condition in the Einstein evolution equation. Uh, formally, a statically flat manifold is like is that close to infinity is like a Euclidean space, and the ratio that is Euclidean is this one is that have to be is like. Uh, the metric is the Euclidean metric times some tensor that goes to zero with this rate. And this rate is important for physical reasons that we are going to see uh, soon in order to define the mass of the of the of, the, of this manifold. So when Einstein in uh, 1915 did the, the Einstein equation or the Hilbert Einstein equation, so the simple uh, example that he found was the, the, the usual one, right? the, the one that we can have all in mind is that the Lorentzian space, the Lorentz-Minkowski space is a four dimensional manifold with one time variable. Uh, and the, say the initial data set is the Euclidean space. This is a flat manifold of them, uh, is the, the trivial example. But one year later, Svartfield found one Amazing example is the, the one that we are going to talk about today. It's, it's one example that also is asymptotically flat. The scalar curvature is bigger than zero, that is going to be important for us, actually, zero in this case has no matter inside that I'm going to define this more or less. I'm going to talk about this uh, in, a, in, a, in a second. And also has a singularity, has a non naked singularity. So at that time, it, it came with a lot of controversy, this example, because 
give uh, gave singularity for the Einstein equation at that time wasn't so clear what that means, this, uh, this singularity. Today, we know that the singularities uh, is like the event horizon of a black hole. So, OK, the draw is not the, the best point of this talk. But, uh, you can see that the idea of a uh, asymptotically flat manifold is something like you have some compact part that can do whatever you want, something compact. And then each end or one end uh, is like, in some sense, approaching to a plane or a hyperplane in this case. Okay. And if you have some kind of singularity or also uh, even horizon, a black hole, so you have something like you have your black hole here in some sense, and then you have may have here topology, and then the end again is asymptotically a Euclidean space. Okay, so the important thing about the synthetically flat manifold, um, also that uh, you have uh, integral scalar curvature, is that you can define this quantity, the ADM mass. The ADM mass is like a, is a how to compute the global mass of a of a space. In, uh, so, in the in the Euclidean space, uh, in, the, in the case that is flat, this quantity is zero. So. But one physical uh, condition, well, actually normal, natural physical condition, is what we call the dominant energy condition. The dominant energy condition in physical terms says that the mass or energy that is the same by, by the instant equation, is that say that can never flow faster than the speed of light. Uh, this, we, we see that in our universe, and we ask that like a normal condition. And, when, we, when you formulate that mathematically uh, for some kind of initial load set, that translates to your hypersurface space-like is that the scalar curvature is bigger than non zero. So that's why we, we normally ask for this condition. So an important thing is that we, we talk about uh, isotropically flat manifold and minimal surface. About uh, minimal surface is that uh, around 79, uh, Shoin and Yao prove one uh, hypothesis in, uh, in physics, there is the positive mass theorem that I'm going to recall in the next slide, using minimal surface inside. So what the, uh, sorry. What the positive mass uh, theorem say that if you have a asymptotically flat manifold of dimension between three and eight with one n, it's more general, but you can think uh, with one n, and satisfying the dominant energy condition, for us, I say is that the scalar coverage is bigger than zero, then the mass must be non-negative. And actually, equality, that, that the mass is zero, if and only if the manifold is isometric to the Euclidean space. And as I say, the, the proof is based on the on stable minimal hypersurface. So, uh, according to this, arise some basic question for this manifold. So, can we find complete stable minimal hypersurface in a theoretically flat manifold? How are they? Um, does the existing imply rigidity? So, in the in the last year, we have some some answers to this question. The first one say in this statement of uh, Alessandro Carlotto. He found the following, that if you have an asymptotically uh, sparse free manifold of non-negative scalar curvature, and this contains a complete, properly embedded, stable minimal surface, then this manifold has to be Euclidean. And the, the, this uh, uh, properly embedded, stable minimal surface has to be a, a plane inside. So we can, we can recall the famous theorem of the Carmopem that say that the only stable minimal surface in R3 are the planes. So this has some ingredients of, the, of that uh, of that uh, theorem for the rigidity part. And also, that was in the case that the space time of the space, the initial data set doesn't have a boundary. And when you have a boundary, you can consider a free boundary minimal surface that proper, but with boundary in the boundary of your asymptotically sparse manifold. And the boundary intersects the boundary of your manifold orthogonally. That's uh, the free boundary condition. 
So in this sense, can also prove that you have a manifold, three, three dimensional is Barthel, asymptotically is Barthel three manifold with compact boundary, which is a horizon and non negative scalar curvature, then you cannot have a stable free boundary minimal surface in the in inside your manifold if the mass is positive and the boundary is weakly minimum back. So we know that we have some restriction in this kind of manifold in order to have properly embedded free boundary minimal surface, or even complete in this case, we don't need to then properly embed. So in the, in, the, in the case of existence in general, uh, Shodos and Ketobe prove the following, that suppose that you, are, you, you have a asymptotically flat three manifold uh, uh, with, the, with the condition that contains no closet embedded minimal surface. That happened in Euclidean space, okay? The Euclidean space doesn't contain any closet embedded minimal surface. So for every point, if you take any point, you have a complete properly embedded minimal plane, minimal disk, that the topology of the, 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 the minimal surface is a disk, as a plane, passing through that point. So I think one year later, uh, uh, Mathet and Rosenberg prove even a stronger result. Even you, you not, not only allow to pres prescribe one point, you can prescribe a point and a plane. If you prescribe a point and a plane, you have a minimal plane, a properly minimal plane that pass through that point with that tangent plane. Or if you prescribe three points in the manifold, you have a plane, a minimal plane, plane when I say plane is topological a plane, properly em embedded minimal plane passing through those points. Actually, they prove that these guys, uh, Rosemary and Mathet, prove that has quite a group. So that mimics what's happening in the Euclidean space. In the Euclidean space, if you have a point and a plane, you always have a plane, a totally just plane passing through that point, or you have three points. Again, you always have three points passing through that, to, uh, to, to have a plane passing through those points. So that means the situation in R3, but they did it in the more general setting of asymptotically flat three manifold. So, but some questions uh, arise from those theorems. So, uh, actually, they prove, uh, Shadows and Ketover, that if the metric not only is asymptotically flat, but the decay condition is stronger, the Morse index of the plane has to be finite. So the thing is that the, the index has to be 0 or 1, it would be the natural thing to think that is between 0 and 1. Uh, but we don't know. And the other thing is that if you have an asymptotically flat manifold with boundary, that the boundary is uh, a minimal surface, can we construct an embedded minimal surface free boundary in that boundary um, properly embedded? So that's not clear if you can do that in general, okay? So, okay, let's uh, go more into the particular case of the Schwarzschild space. That is, this is the space, is the is R3 minus a ball, okay? is Rn, Rn minus a ball with this metric. That when the when you go to infinity, this guy goes to zero in an appropriate rate and this metric approach to the Euclidean metric. So the horizon is this manifold here, this manifold here, hypersurface, is when the, the radius is equal to the mass or this quantity to the mass. This is the mass of the space, the ADN mass. This is the parameter, it's a one parameter family of spaces. And this, you can prove, it's not, we will see in a second, that this guy is minimal in this manifold. And this is the horizon. This is the, the black hole of your manifold. So this is like a, a picture of the uh, 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 space. So this is the horizon, okay? And then at infinity, it becoming flat. So in that time, Montezuma, Rafael Montezuma, uh, in 2019, proved the following, is that we have, uh, in the three-dimensional case, is R3 minus a ball. So, uh, so take the exterior of a, of a plane passing through the origin. Then he proved that this guy is a 
totally geodesic non compact free boundary minimal surface with most index one. So we know about Carlotto that uh, you cannot have something with uh, index zero. So what he proved that this guy has index one, okay? So the natural question is what's happening in higher dimension. And in higher dimension, we prove that this guy, this hyperplane now, the exterior of this hyperplane, uh, is stable, in fact. is uh, for dimension bigger than four. The exterior of a plane in the uh, spatial space has more index uh, zero. So what is more index? The Morse index is the, the number of direction where you, where you can decrease the area for variation that are tangential to the boundary. So we will see more uh, this index more in detail in a second, but uh, this is the geometrical meaning of this uh, most index. How can I deform infinitesimally the, the, the surface in order, or the hypersurface in this case, in order to decrease the area up to second order? So, but, we have more questions in this sense. So is this guy the only one which is stable or we can find more uh, hypersurface that are stable in, the, in higher dimension, okay? Because in dimension three, we know about a lot of that that's not possible. So, and then the, the answer is that we have a plenty, we have plenty of them. We have plenty of uh, hypersurface that are stable. And uh, in dimension bigger or equal than eight, you have as many as you want. Uh, we will see what happens in dimension between four and seven too. So, and in order to find this hypersurface, what we are going to study are cones. So, because you can you can think in this the exterior of a plane as a cone, right? A cone over the equator on the sphere. So, but in higher dimension, and following the seminal word of uh, Jane Simon, uh, you can you can you can do the following: you take for dimension bigger than four, so you have the, the sphere of dimension three, you can consider a hypersurface, a minimal hypersurface in the sphere, and then construct the cone over this uh, minimal hypersurface. Then what you have is a cone in the Euclidean space, okay? Uh, and you can also consider this cone in the Svasti space. And what you can see is that this cone is also minimal in the Euclidean and the Svasti metric. And we are going to study the index of these guys using the, the word of uh, Jane Simon. So in that sense, what we are going to relate is that how the, the, the index or the first second value of the minimal surface in the sphere that you take in order to, to create the cone uh, implies the stability or not of your cone. And uh, in that sense, we prove this, the following theorem, that if the first second value of the um, of the base of the cone is the hypersurface in the in the in the sphere satisfies this condition, then the cone itself is stable in the sparsely space. So we are going to do this this theorem in detail or give you the ideas of this theorem. And also we prove uh, in between dim dimension four and seven, for dimension eight, we saw that we have plenty of uh, examples uh, uh, which are not stable, but in between the dimension four and seven, we can prove that actually the Morse in the is finite if and only if it's totally geodesic. In, in fact, if and only if it's stable. So the, you cannot have something in between. Either these cones are stable or has infinite index. You cannot have something with a finite index. So for that, a question that uh, that I will propose later is to find something with finite index that actually cannot be a cone in this dimension. So for dimension uh, bigger than number four, we can find infinitely many non-compact free boundary minimal hypersurface in the spatial space which are not congruent to each other with infinite most index. This this follow from the previous. Uh, previous to, to theory, and they are constructed by cones. So once the, once that you you change your your minimal hypersurface in the sphere, you change the cone, and then you have many examples. 
a plethora of examples. So as I say, this it would be interesting to find or to prove the existence of, of properly embedded free boundary minimal hypersurface in the varsity space for dimension bigger than one and four with more index say one. Um, uh, when we were doing the, the paper, so a good candidate can be the, the catenoid, right? So it's the, the first one that, or catenoidal type um, uh, examples. So recently I knew that Ezequiel Barbosa and David Moya from the studio Joaquin Perez are close to establish this kind of catenoidal type, minimal hypersurface, which are free, bond free boundary on the, on the event horizon. So I hope that they, they can finally um, answer this, this question. So let me, uh, in this part, let me give you a two set of ideas, one to prove instability and the other one to prove stability. Uh, and I'm going to prove two theorems that actually the ideas of all the theorems follow from these two. So, okay, this uh, I'm going to remember a little bit uh, the virtual space, what it did before. So it's the exterior of a ball of a, in the Euclidean space. So take the Euclidean space, remove a ball, and put this metric in the in the in this exterior of the ball. Okay. So seeing these two metrics, you can see you can see here that are conformal. The sparsely metric is conformal to the Euclidean metric. It's easy to compute the, um, the second fundamental form of uh, radial spheres. It's a for, uh, easy form for that. And the way uh, we can compute that, uh, we can see that the second fundamental form for the sphere of re radius r in the Euclidean space, right, is given by this formula. It's, so it's also it's umbilical, right, because uh, a conformal chain of metric have to preserve immobility. And you can even compute this, this quantity here is given by this. So we can see that when we R is equal to R naught, that is the one of the even horizon, has to be totally uh, geodesic. This is zero, right? So doing the same for the for this plane, we can prove that this guy is a close totally geodesic hypersurface name. And this guy, uh, coordinate plane, the exterior of a coordinate plane that I'm taking to be the, the horizontal one, of simplicity, actual rotation is the same, is also totally genetic, more than minimal, right? <clears throat> okay, so what are the ideas here involved? So what we're going to do is the following. First, we're going to see that it's, for many of you, it's, it's clear, right? The cones are minimal in the Euclidean and the sparsely metric. And this is because the, the support function is zero on a cone, right? The product of the position vector times the normal is zero in a cone. So that makes you that these guys have to be uh, uh, have to be minimal in both metrics. So for the set of uh, uh, part of instability, we're going to relate the index form in the spatial space and the Euclidean space. And here in the Euclidean space, we're going to use the Simon description of the of this uh, index form. Or in the case of stability, we are going to use the Simon description of eigen functions, and we are going to use a criterion, a physical criterion, for the in order to prove the stability. So that, that those are the two sets of ideas, but more or less are contained here. That we first that cones are minimal in both cases. That we can relate in some in a sense in a very specific sense, the index form, and then use what we know in the clear space that we know by Simons in order to uh, to obtain stability or instability. Okay, so as I say, if you have a cone in the, uh, say, the clear space or the sparsely space, so we, you can prove that easily that uh, is um, is minimal. It's a, it's a minimal cone in both cases. Because if you take a minimal hypersurface in SN and you construct the cone, it's trivial to see that it's minimal in the Euclidean space. Now, since the metric are conformal, you have this conformal chain for the for the mean curvature in the Svartil space. 
But this is nothing but the support function at the end when you do, because this factor here depends on the position vector. So this guy is going to depend, it's going to be a multiple of the uh, support function. And as we know, this is zero, right, in a, in a cone. So this is zero because it's a cone, and this is zero because we are taking a minimal hypersurface as the base. So it's going to be minimal too. So, okay. Now what we know that our minima in both uh, spaces, we're going to relate the metric, the intrinsic metrics of the cones in the Euclidean space and the, and the sparsely metric. And we know that in general, the, they are conformal by this factor. And then when we restrict these metrics in the cone, this is the restricted metric in the cone of the sparsely metric. And this one is the restricted metric of the Euclidean metric in the cone. And then they are also related by a conformal factor that is given by this. Now what we change is the uh, this quotient here. It's not more two over two n minus two, and now it's n minus two over n minus two, where this n is the dimension of the hypersurface n minus one. It will be n minus three over n minus two. So this is a simple computation. So we see that they are conformal related that is going to be important later. So when that we, uh, we have that, uh, we can relate the second fundamental form. We have related the, the first fundamental form, and now we are going to relate the second fundamental form. And the second fundamental form are related by this quantity here. And also we know that in the Euclidean case, the second fundamental form as an Euclidean hypersurface is related with the scalar curvature. Okay, this is, uh, something general for uh, for any minimal hypersurface in a, in a Euclidean space, right? That the trace or the, the square norm, the second fundamental form, is minus the scalar curvature, right? For this formula here. So now we can relate the first fundamental form by the conformal factor and the second fundamental form instead of the conformal factor and these quantities here. So the Morse index, what is the, the Morse index? As I say, geometrically is the number of direction that uh, you can decrease the area up to second order for variation that are tangential to the boundary. Analytically is that you can find the, the Morse index is the number of functions or the linear independent function where this quadratic form is negative, right? Is the, is, what it says is equivalent. One is geometrically and the one is uh, analytically. The thing is that we are going to work for uh, in um, properly embedded. So this normally is used for compact uh, regions on, the, on your surface. So what we are going to do is truncate your uh, our hypersurface, proper hypersurface. We're going to define an index from this compact part, for the truncated part, and then take a limit. That's normally what we do for uh, stability for complex uh, surface or hypersurface or whatever. So specifically, what we're going to do is the following. I'm going to consider proper uh, hypersurface, okay? And what I'm going to say is, uh, what I'm going to co consider is a, it's a ball of radius R in the place of space. I'm going to cut in this compact region, in this compact annulus in the, in the space. And I'm going to consider the index uh, for variation, the for function that vanish in the outward uh, boundary. And I'm going to call this index, this in F, and we're going to, to take is the limit of this guy. And this is going to be the most index of our proper hypersurface. This is the, the definition that we're going to, to take. It's, uh, it's taken from Raphael uh, in this setting. <clears throat> so the thing is the following, right? This is this interior boundary is like our even horizon here we allow the function to do whatever they want. And here in this boundary, we impose that the function is zero. So what we see in the in the hypersurface is that this angular region, this might have to you know, might have to follow you, right? But uh, in the simple case that we have to consider it a coordinate plane in order to, to make a picture, this will be the inner boundary that is the one that uh, intercept the, the event horizon. And this one, we are going to fix the this condition that the function is equal to zero. You, you, you don't move the boundary in infinity, uh, at infinity, sorry, at this other boundary. Okay, so that is equivalent 
to define the following. The, the most interesting is the number of negative eigenvalues to this problem, right? With this, when the eigenvalue is this guy, this beta, with these two boundary conditions, let's say zero at the outer boundary, and this condition here for the conormal on the inner boundary. This follows because the inner boundary is totally elastic, right? This is the condition. So, okay, in order to study instability, we're going even to particularize even more the, the index, uh, the index form. Is that we allowing the inner boundary to take any value that we want to the, to the function, but we're going to even particularize for those that are Dirichlet in the sense that are zero in both, uh, in both boundaries. So if you find functions that are zero in both boundaries, you can have more than one quality component, right? But uh, imagine that uh, you, you, you only have one. That in the boundary component, in the interior and exterior is zero, and you find functions that decrease or that the quadratic form is negative inside, then that function you can use in the most index in general. So you will, you will find uh, direction, you will find index. So if we prove that the Dirichlet most index is infinite, then we will prove that the most index is infinite. So that's the idea in this part. And this is the theorem that we are going to prove because it's the one that contains all the ideas for instability. So the idea, as I say, is to relate the Spartan and the Euclidean Dirichlet index form. When you, when you impose Dirichlet condition, it's zero the function f in all the exterior boundaries, here and here, right? So what you have for this uh, index form is this one. This is for the, this is the Jacobi operator, right? The usual Jacobi operator. This is the one for the Sparsil metric. This is the Rishi Karsha in the Sparsil space. And this is the second fundamental form as I perceive in the Sparsil space. And this is as a Euclidean hyperstar, right? So what we're going to do is relate these two. So what we're going to do is to relate the Jacobi operator of both, right? To so say this is the Jacobi operator for the hypersurface in the Sparsil manifold, and this is in the Euclidean manifold. And what we're going to use is these three ingredients: the gas equation, the relationship between the Euclidean and the Sparsil second fundamental form that we saw before, and the relation between the conformal Yamaha operator. So the conformal Yamaha operator is given by this quantity here and is conformal invariant up to conformal factor. So this part has some computation, but I'm going to try to only highlight where we use those ingredients that I say previously. So this is the Jacob operator. So what we are going to do here is to use the the Yamaha conformal operator in order to replace the Laplacian by the conformal Yamaha operator. Then I have this quantity here. Second, we're going to use the, uh, use the Gauss equation here, okay? The Gauss equation tell you that, and then you can put this scalar curvature with this scalar curvature, and then you have this uh, equation here. And then, what we're going to use is to use this relation of the conformal Laplacian of conformal metric. I, I change, look at the previous one, u, I'm going to multiply by f minus one, and then I'm going to replace here in the equation. So this condition, and I have this. Okay, now I have the Laplacian with respect to the Euclidean metric. I have the scalar curvature that is the same that the second fundamental form as Euclidean metric. And this also I can relate with the second fundamental form as a Euclidean hypersurface. But this I cannot. So I need to do something with this. I need to see what happened with the scalar curvature of a hypersurface in the Sparsil metric and relate it with some Euclidean term in some sense. That is going to be the next step. And the idea is to use what happened with this equation. When I take one here, this is going to be zero, and then I have this relation, and then I can 
I can relate from this part where I have is this term here, and from this part where I have is this, this is the, the definition. Then I can uh, replace this, this value of the scalar curvature by these two terms here, that this is also is going to depend on the second fundamental form. This here. And finally, reordering of the term, what we are going to have is that the Jacobi operator as a hypersurface in the Schwarzschild metric, I can write as an operator that is going to split in the Jacobi operator as a Euclidean hypersurface plus, say, this potential, this new term here. Okay? So you have multiplied and integrate. So what I can see is that the index form for these values, this is function, is equal to the index form as a Euclidean hypersurface plus or minus in this case, okay, this time. Okay. Now this term is nothing but this. You can compute this because you have an explicit uh, formula for F, right? It's the conformal factor. So you can compute this, and this guy is this guy here. Okay, it's, it's just the computation. Okay, now we need to study this thing. But this were studied by Simon. And what, what, we, uh, what he did is to split variables, right? And what he found is the following. So if I have uh, a cone, so I can split in the radial uh, direction and the base, uh, he found the egging function for, for this problem. So in the radial direction, you have this initial value, value problem where you can actually solve the equation with this data here, okay? Between two values, you take two, two values in the real direction, you always, you, you always can find this, this solution. Uh, okay, and in the other hand, for the base, what you can find is that the, the, the solute, the, when you have something that in the, in the, in the operator is a, an eigen function, what you are going to have in the, in the base is an eigen function of the Jacobi operator, the usual Jacobi operator. And this we control, or at least is well studied, this Jacobi operator for minimal closed hypersurface in the, in, the, in the sphere. Okay, so now if you take some function that is split in these two in the radial and the base, so you can see any, any, any function here as a sum, infinite sum of this uh, eigen function and initial value problem, and you can compute the, the index form for this uh, uh, function here, which is zero on the boundaries, both boundaries, in this time. So this is the eigen values of the Jacobi operator in the sphere, the hypersurface in the sphere, and these are the eigen values for the initial value problem in the radial direction that we control. So, perfect. If we can, if we, we want to prove the theorem, what we are going to use is these guys. So, what we are going to consider is the first second function. Okay, we take a cone. Okay, general cone. So we know that we have a base. So minimal hypersurface. So we are going to consider the first second function. We know that the first second function is always positive. Perfect. And we are going to multiply by one of the uh, solution to the initial value problem. Okay, this depends on, on some parameter that the, uh, is in the natural. Uh, so you you have a infinite number of these guys, and they are linearly independent. And we are going to plug this into the index form. So it's going to say um, it's going to be the index form of the uh, Euclidean that like we know what we is is the first second value because we are taking the first second function in the in the sphere plus this term that comes from the uh, eigen value of this guy here plus some term that depend on the potential and some rest of the initial value problem like this guy here and this quantity here is this quantity here so now we are going to see that the condition that we impose makes that this guy is negative Okay, for dimension between uh, four and seven, and this guy goes to zero for R big. 
follow. And say the following. Fix any J yeah, in the natural. So for some R that is going to be big and depending on this J here, this goes to zero. However, the other part, because we know that if not totally geodesic, the first second value is smaller, smaller or equal than minus n minus two. Then in between dimension four and seven, this quantity is negative. Then the this quantity here, this the Morse index, is going to be negative for each j that we take and for r large. So and since these guys are linear independent, so we can find that either it's totally geodesic, that this guy is zero, and this is going to be positive, or this guy is negative and we have infinite index. That's how we prove instability. That's the idea. Okay, now in order to prove stability, we are going to go to another set of idea and is to prove to to use the Fisher Cobb criteria. In the case of stability in a, in, in a manifold, so Fisher Cobb in the 80s, she proved the following you have a positive subsolution to the Jacobi operator, then you can prove that your manifold is stable. Uh, we are going to rephrase that theorem that is actually the same computation we did nothing but we are going to rephrase that in our setting and what we are going to do in this part is to obtain this positive subsolution to the Jacobi equation and with that we are going to prove this theorem so under this condition we are going to prove that the if your cone satisfies that the first second value satisfy this inequality then have to be stable in particular if you, you take the plane, this guy is going to be zero, and then this is always bigger than zero. That's why it's stable for dimension bigger than for the coordinate plane. Okay, so and we, uh, in order to do that, we need to study this operator, right? And we're going to do as uh, as um, Simon, Jim Simon. So we're going to split the this guy into the base and the radial direction. So we need to study this thing, we know that Simon studied this in the sense that, so suppose that you have an function for that operator, then the base part has to be an function for the Jacobi operator, perfect, it's here. And the royal part has to be a solution to this family of Stullio V operators here. And this potential in our case depends on the, in the case of Simon, this is zero, right? Um, in the case of, in our case, depend on the on this potential that depend on the conformal factor that we can compute explicitly. That is this one. Okay. So the thing that we have to study subsolution to this operator in some sense, and we are going to do a chain of variables in order to make it simple. So in the sense that if we chain this u. There have to be a solution to that thing. This B have to be a solution to this guy here. To this operator is more simple. Where W is this potential. Okay, that depend. It depend on the on the first second value of the base, and this one depend on the on the potential, right? That depend on the conformal factor. So what we are going to do is to find sub, uh, solution to this part plus this part. So, and then we are going to use this criterion, as I say, right? So in order to prove stability, say that the index is zero, we only need to prove that we have a positive solution to the Jacobi operator with this free boundary condition in the inner boundary. So this is the fisher cobb criterion is that we only rephrase what fisher cobb did for complete uh, surfaces in a, in a in a three dimensional manifold in this setting with boundary. So, but the, the computation are exactly the same. So, they say that if the, you can have a subsolution to the Jacobi operator positive, so that the, at the inner boundary, the conormal derivative is zero, then you can prove that it's stable, this guy. Because the index is, is in each compact region is going to be zero, or bigger than zero. Sorry, zero, zero. 
So um, to so we found this solution to this part of the uh, Sturliovil uh, operation. You, you can hear me, uh, Isabel? Now, yeah, 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 yes. Now we you can. lost me for a, for a while? <laughs> we, we lost, yeah, we lost you 10, 10 seconds. Okay. So what I was saying is that uh, what we found is this function, this function B that is positive and satisfy this equation, okay? And then when we plug this function that depends on B in the Stanley Bill operator that we had, so satisfy this condition. Okay, and this is the, the condition that we were imposed in the in the game bio, right? So that's the the idea. So I say this is the theorem. Suppose you have a minimal cone, uh, satisfy this condition, the first second value, then have to be stable. And the proof is is the following. Uh, this condition implies that when I take this function. And it plug in the first standard build uh, uh, operator satisfy that is less or equal than zero. And if I consider this function on the cone, okay, that is you have to multiply the uh, component factor, the function u times the first second function that is positive, right? Because it's the first second function of the of the hypersurface of the bay. Then this guy that you can compute explicitly up to the first second function is positive, okay? And moreover, because this condition, let's say that the Jacobi operator on this function is less or equal than zero in the whole manifold. Now you only have to compute the corona derivatives in the radial direction, like this one, and you can see that in the when r is r not, this guy is zero. Then this derivative is zero. Then you can apply the fisher coburn criterion and you have a positive subsolution so that the conormal is zero along the interior boundary. Then you prove that it's stable. It has to this condition. So those are the, the, <coughs> the ideas involved for stability. The thing is that uh, we, we did that for the uh, Barfield uh, space, but if you see that those ideas, you can use it in any, say, conformal method to the one uh, of the sphere. Now, the potential that it remains is going to be more complicated, probably, but you can use these ideas in, in any other uh, spaces as the, the Cities Barty, Rainer Nostrum. Uh, we realize that later, uh, but I think it's uh, probably interesting that so you, you can do that. In, more, in a more general setting, not only in this varsity space. That's why I will. Uh, I wanted to give you the ideas how to do it because only really depend on this that there are cones in this space that are conformal to the to the Euclidean one, and then you can use the Simon's idea, and the remaining term you can deal with them. In in our case, so if you consider a general conformal factor, you have to see what you need, right? But probably it's interesting for someone. Okay, so but still some questions, right? Because we have, for example, for cones, we can prove that they are stable or infinite uh, index. So in dimension three, for example, uh, in the in Raphael uh, theorem, can we prove that the only one with index one is the coordinate plane? I don't know. Um, for example, in dimension between four and seven, we know that the only with finite index is the, the coordinate plane. Uh, can we prove that actually the only one, which is a cone, is a, it has, is a stable. But can we prove that actually is the only one among properly embedded free boundary minimum hypersurface? So it would be too, too interesting question to, to solve. Or the one that I said before is that can one construct like catenoidal type ends um, with more index finite? 
one for example i don't know so isa is uh, should i have five more minutes Please? yeah 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 sure okay. we, we started like 10 minutes later at the end I'm on okay thank you all the interruption okay so bonus density we are going to talk uh, about the density in that um, as, uh, before that this is based in uh, Raphael's work that uh, he did uh, this density formula in dimension three so we expand it to any dimension but we have some different that are interesting at least so where is the density the density that take a, a cone any cone and take a properly embedded uh, free boundary minimal hypersurface any and that doesn't have to be a cone right and cut with a big ball and consider the ratio of the volumes of the properly embedded uh, minimal free boundary hypersurface and the one with the with the cone here the interesting thing is that in dimension bigger than three four or bigger you have as many cones as you want in dimension three you only have one cone that is the one given by the equator right is the only minimal cone that you have but in bigger dimension you have a plethora of cones so that's why in bigger dimension you can define a density that depend that depend on the base that you take okay okay the thing the this density formula that we are going to to relate is the one that relates the density with the area of the base in some time that's the what's happened with the monotonicity formula right in in general in the in the euclidean space okay so the thing is that if you take a properly embedded minimal hypersurface in the dark field space so the area of the boundary in the horizon is less or equal that two times the mass depending on the uh, space that you are considering of the, the mass times the area or the volume of the base times the density and equality hot if and only if this guy the initial one was a minimal cone and in this case you have this relationship between the density and the area of the base with the area of the of the uh, of the boundary okay these are the the relationship this is is that so observe that the the horizon doesn't have to be in the sphere of radius one but when you do the homotopy by this factor this guy is going to be in the sphere of radius one right as this one so and this is the exact equality that you, you that you have okay uh -huh. okay so as i say in dimension three you only have one cone and that uh, equality you have equality in the in the in the in the inequality also you can say more you can say not only is a minimal cone but if it's a minimal cone in dimension three you only have one minimal cone that is the plane then you know that is the plane in our case we don't know that is the plane because depend on the on the base that you take but using the resolution of the Wilman conjecture in dimension four imposing one more condition uh, we can uh, at least give you some rigidity in the following sense is that assume that you have an embedded uh, minimum hypersurface okay and that is free boundary and you have equality in the density inequality and um, the area of the base times the density is less or equal than twice pi squared this is the the wilmot right the, the the one that appears, uh, appears in the wilmot conjecture then after rotation we know that this guy has to be either a plane a hyperplane or is a minimal cone over a clifford tall so because this condition will give you that the area of the uh, um, of the boundary have to in in the sphere of radius one have to be less or equal than this quantity and then by the result of uh, fernando andre have to be either the equator or the clifford Torai torus so that's the that's the, the result is not more than that 
And in general, if you use the, uh, in any dimension, the R regularity theorem, uh, where you say that if you are close, if you are a minimal closed uh, hypersurface embedded, and you are close to the area, close by this constant here, to the area of the of an equator, you have to be an equator. That's what it says. And then what we did is the, is the following, right? If more than the quality, this quantity is less or equal than the one that gives you the other regularity theorem, then actually your 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 cone has to be um, a coordinate plane. So and now yes, I finish, and this is all. And thank you very much. Thank you, Jose. So I think I managed to to restore the bottoms for uh, speaking and uh, sharing the video. So if anyone has any question, you can just turn on your microphone. Or if you still don't have the button for the microphone in their screen, just uh, raise your hand and I will give you the, the permission. So are there any questions? Okay, so uh, if not, I thank you again, Jose Maria, for, for 